Hi, my name is Rolf Agner, and welcome to On Air with Sick. In this season of our podcast, we're providing some valuable information on the use of autonomous mobile robots, or AMRs, in the manufacturing and material handling industries. Today on our show, I'm joined by Brian Duncan, who will be my co-host for part two of this interview with John Hayes from Vecna Robotics. Brian is the National Sales Manager for Retail Distribution at SICK, and John Hayes is the Vice President of Sales at Vecna Robotics. These two had a great conversation about some trends they are seeing in AMRs in the retail industry. Take it away, Brian. So when you, let's go to the IoT. What is your interface like? Is it with the customer's business system or with their a WCS or? Yeah, so the, generally speaking, it starts at the WMS, WCS level. Okay. When we have systems that, especially in retail and grocery, we see that all the time because they are picking solutions. So they have a WMS or a WCS or a picking system in place. And we'll implement an API or what we used to call a host interface, which just tells us, tells each side how we're going to talk to each other and what the messages are going to look like. But one of the things that we are seeing in the age of IIoT is what does that information mean and how far past that? I, I don't know if you remember this concept or not, but I know you were there at the time, the, the four walls and two windows approach to, yeah. to, to, <laughs> to our equipment. Yeah, so the, the key now is, okay, so we have some of this information. What happens if we look both further upstream and further downstream to determine demand? Especially, you know, thinking about your comment of you have grocers now and retailers who are working at holiday levels. If you could have some visibility that this was coming, you can plan for it more appropriately. And we do have a package for that. It's called Pivotal. And Pivotal looks upstream, looks downstream, and it, can, and it has those hooks, APIs, to talk to other software systems so that we can see both what retail looks like. We can take the data and provide a model of what we think will happen over time as well as push work to the appropriate resources in the facility. So it's not just important to know what's happening in the facility or upstream and downstream if you can't do anything about it. Mm -hmm. And that's the important thing about Pivotal is that it pushes work to the appropriate resource, meaning not just Vecna Robotics pieces of equipment. And, And we can start off with Pivotal with no equipment whatsoever. Oh. You can actually track MHEs or, or fork trucks, tuggers, pallet jacks, those things with people on them to determine where they're going, how much work they're doing, and back calculate from that, you know, what are your efficiencies? So you get to that kind of engineered rate that you talked about in grocery. And then you can add robots, Vecna Robotics robot, for instance, or uh, push data down to wrist-mounted computers for people for picking. Mm-hmm. So... Pivotal can look at this from this holistic level and not just provide the work, but also look at the workflows and make some predictive judgments of what's coming in the future. So IIoT, you know, when it first, you know, in our industry, buzzwords are a huge thing. Every trade show, there's a new buzzword. (laughs) And IIoT was one several years ago, and it still exists, but the key is getting that data and being able to make it actionable. Mm-hmm. And and that's occurring. Now, IoT is still a buzzword. It's not the latest, greatest buzzword, but it is still something that's very important to be able to understand what your system is doing because you're tying all these things together. Hmm. No, it's becoming more and more important to the customer. It sounds like what you've, what you've got there is a really, really helpful tool to make the whole system work. You know, we tend to look at what does the vehicle do without thinking about it? It doesn't just do that. It's got to let somebody know what it's doing, right? And it's got to it, do it for the purpose. Absolutely, it does. You, you couldn't be more correct there. And if you don't understand what the trends look like over time, you're just going to make the same mistakes over and over again. Or, yeah. or you could do the right thing and not know that you're doing the right thing. You know, and you can make changes that make things worse and you just don't know. So you're absolutely correct. So let's talk about your business in general, without getting too specific. Currently, what are you seeing as a focus for you? What market? Well, so 
we've just taken, again, not being too specific, we've just gotten our second round of venture funding. And when you do that, you have to change your paradigm of how you go to market a little bit. Mm-hmm. And we've changed our paradigms to verticals. Our used to, we used to have a pure sales, kind of region-based sales philosophy. Mm-hmm. And, and that works if you are very reactive. So your marketing leads your sales, and then you know your sales leads your company. And I know that's a kind of a trite way to look at it, but marketing drives demand, and then sales tries to, to meet that demand with things that may or may not exist. So it keeps you on your toes, and it also fills your funnel very quickly, but it doesn't create the long-term uh, sustainability that a vertical sales market does, which is you know your food and beverage, your grocery, your retail, those sorts of things. Mm-hmm. So right now, we still see a large portion of our market being automotive and manufacturing, and you know automotive has been the biggest user of AGVs for so long, I can't even remember. Oh, yeah. Manufacturing much the same. However, I don't think that tells the whole story. I have been focusing on, oddly, retail and grocery mm-hmm. and seeing a huge increase in just the audits that we're doing and people looking into, you know, what can we do with this equipment? So I'm seeing a lot of increase there. Uh, more on the retail side, but a lot of grocery as well. The, the key benefit with grocery is you can do that first step automation pretty simply, the one where you're case picking and keeping people in zones. So I'm seeing a lot of an, a lot of uptick in grocery there, more so in retail though, to be perfectly honest. And mostly in retail, uh, people are looking for new technology. So they're they're looking to the Amazons of the world and saying, you know, what's the next thing that's coming, you know, with the, the Amazon purchase of Kiva and that solution? You know, is there something like that? You, If you go to a trade show, you'll see a couple companies that have copied that solution. But but there are, at Modex, I bet there were a hundred different AMR providers that really didn't have a, a fully vetted solution, but had the kernels of some really good concepts. Retailers are really looking for something new and different to be able to meet this demand it sounds like though your business is you, you're you're kind of broad. You're handling at the pallet level and at the case or tote level. So you're working in both those uh, markets. We are, and um, early on, uh, so I, I came to Vecno Robotics at Promat, probably the two three. So there's Modex. So it's been three years ago to kind of kick off the logistics market. That's what we were calling it at the time. And it's pretty easy for me to walk into a new company and see where there are gaps or see where there are some advantages. Mm-hmm. And right off the bat, we had some pretty significant advantages. Number one, AMR technology is a common sense advantage, right? So it drives around things versus stopping and waiting. That's, that's a mathematical concept of not sitting and waiting for somebody to move a piece of stretch wrap off the floor. Mm-hmm. But... We also started as an AMR company and moved to the OEM world, which means that we started as a bot company. We've got bots down to what we call an RC20, which is really a tote handling robot that can can be used for picking. Mm -hmm. Uh, RC20, so it's kilograms, so it's 44 pounds. RC500, which is more of the drive under pick cart concept where we would drive under the cart and pick it up. So line side delivery as well as picking. Uh, moving up from there, we have the OEM style vehicles. We have a tugger, a pallet jack, and now a forklift vehicle. Mm. So we we have the AGV side of the world covered to some degree. Now, AGV vendors are typically companies that custom build vehicles per application. So, you know, they, they can build nearly anything. We concentrate on an OEM concept of we put our controls on right now unicarrier vehicles but we've done other vendors in the past Mm -hmm. the bots are our own we build those ourselves but we've got the agv side covered and we've got the amr side covered and it's all with the same technology so to date and i'm sure people will catch up quickly uh, we're the only company that has that kind of uh, full product line of of small bots all the way up to you know ten thousand pound tuggers available in one product line Mm -hmm. Yeah, we do. T- we do typically see a specialization, so that's that's why I asked the question because it 
it seemed like you're working in all those different areas, which is interesting and probably pretty wise nowadays because you don't exactly know what's going to what's going to boom next, right? You you think you do, but it's is it going to be at the tote level, the carton level, or are we going to start worrying about um, like in the grocery example? Uh, we we're getting a lot of um, inquiries about working in freezer environments, you know, minus twenty, minus ten, uh, which is uh, probably sounds like a pretty good application for an AGV or an AMR, but it's not something that a lot of people are doing. But it sounds like you've positioned yourself to be able to kind of move in these different discipline areas. We have. We've been very lucky that way, and I think that. You know, it's it's attributable to our engineering team and, and our founder, Daniel Theobald, but I get asked this, or I used to get asked it, I don't get asked very often this question, but I'm going to put it out there. What What's the difference today versus what was happening in the past or what makes Vecna Robotics different? The answer is not the technology and it's not the vehicles, it's actually young engineers. Wow. So guys like you and I may look at a solution and draw a straight line, which is this is the way it's always been done and this is the way we should do it because I know this works. Well, you know, we're uniquely positioned because we're a Boston company, our founder from MIT, and we've got, you know, roboticists from MIT, Carnegie Mellon, all those other schools, which are incredibly talented, smart kids. I call them kids, you know, they're probably in their thirties at this point. Yeah. But, exactly. But, but they don't look at things the same way that, that we do. And that's a real benefit. And it allows us to look for solutions and ways to do projects with newer technology that we just wouldn't do. And I, you and I were both at some very large companies. It's like turning a ship when you're at those companies. There, there is risk aversion and trying to generate as much profit as you can from a project, which means that you, you're typically not super willing to make changes to your technology because it imparts risk to the project. And I think we all know that every project has a bump and in that bump, it's how you handle it. And if you're creating that bump, it costs you money, not the customer. So most companies just aren't willing to take steps with respect to changing technology or using new sensors or using new guidance platforms or, or recognition platforms. And smaller companies are, but there is a, there's a fine line there. And that fine line is if you spend too much time concentrating on the tech, you lose sight of the customer. So, you know, you have to be careful that you're, you know, that you're not doing technology for technology's sake and you're, you're using it as part of your offering to make the customer's life easier. And I see that absolutely at Fechner Robotics. And that's why this is such a great company. I'm, I'm really happy to be here. It really is. The cool thing about what you observed about uh, the people that you, the, the, the whiz kids that are working for you, we're seeing them at our customers too. Which Absolutely. Is, it's exciting and challenging at the same time. And to go a little further with that, some of the biggest, you and I both know who they are, some of the biggest customers or the biggest accounts retailers in the world are looking heavily at startup type companies. Not that Vecna is one, but where you have this agility and the ability to come up with new fresh ideas and you're not beholden to that big shareholder group that you know <laughs> that, right. that, that you make that certain amount of margin every year uh, and you're right the big companies they just they want to do a lot of the same things that generate uh, consistent profit totally understand that but what it's doing is it's causing some of these bigger companies to go to smaller startups like I said before to get new fresh ideas. Now, then the challenge comes if they if they adopt it, how do they scale it? But it's a whole different problem, right? It is. The one problem that almost all startups have is a lack of understanding of integration. Everybody understands, you know, that, that, that we need to move product around, but they really don't understand installation and integration and the problems that you have implementing a system outside of a lab. And most startups, most startups have no clue what that looks like. And so we see exactly what you're talking about. And most of our customers, the larger ones, will sponsor those smaller companies and us into a room and try to figure out how we can maybe utilize some of their technology with what we have or, you know, integrate it into what we're providing. And it's a really good concept because there's a lot of risk, a lot of risk for buying a, a systemized product from a company 
that's only done it in a lab. You know, we've all seen videos, and, and the more you're around, you start to look for telltale items in a video, like a flashing light that just looks like it's flashing a little too fast, mm-hmm. uh, where, where it's been, you know, somebody's done something in a lab but sped the video up or cut sections of the video out. There's, there's a lot of risk in taking on projects with those smaller companies, but you're not going to find that level of new product technology, generally speaking, from a large company like we used to work for. It just doesn't happen. Yeah, I agree. We do a lot of what we call triangulation right now, which is keeping the end user up to date on technology that we produce so that they know, okay, this is possible. And then they could take it to someone like Vecna or one of these little startups and say, okay, this sensor will do this. Did you know that? And can we use this? And then, and, and, you know, may or may or may not work out, but the conversation is certainly worth having. They're trying to keep themselves covered on all sides, which I think, which I think is very smart. And I think at the end of the day, they'll come up with some, some pretty innovative, deployable solutions. I think so as well. Yeah, we see it every day. So I got really one last question. We've gone on for a long time. This has been a great conversation, by the way. This is kind of something we've been thinking about. But when you look at the current situation we're in with the COVID-19, I'll call it disruption. Earthquake may be more like it. But have, have has your business begun to turn to look at applications specific to this kind of uh, pandemic, for example, this kind of disruption? Yes and no. The yes is our company has always been very community centric and we spend a lot of time and effort on those things. And we are working within the Boston community to to build some devices, some medical devices uh, to be able to address this. So yes, we are. And it's not necessarily in our industry. So, so we're building a mechanical ventilator is what we're, we're working on and um, some press releases recently about it. So absolutely we are, but not on the revenue generating side. On the revenue generating side, we're not really focusing on specific things. And you see some, especially in the Far East where the robots are doing sterilization and cleaning work and those sorts of things. Mm-hmm. We haven't gone to that level but we do see that you know there is a future step of what do we need to do to prepare for this in the future if this occurs and that that's that sea level concept that we're talking about of you know 10 years from now what's this whole thing going to look like so absolutely we're seeing a lot of it but i think what we're seeing which i think is remarkable is almost all of these companies ours included are looking at ways to help that's almost outside of the industry outside of revenue generating products. And I think that is, that's remarkable for any company to take a step back, to look at the, you know, what, what's happening in the world. You know, how are we making humans lives better? Not, not just by ROI and those sorts of things, but through, you know, different, whether, whether it's making masks or making ventilators, if you're doing that sort of thing, you're making humanity better and you've got to feel pretty good about that. That has been one of the most gratifying things, if you can look at a silver lining, is that industry is stepping up to help people and they're not they're not focused on their bottom line at all. If we come up with a technology that's applicable, like you say, 10 years down the, down the road for something like this, we'll hang on to it and make sure that we're ready to deploy. But that is, I'm with you, that's not the focus. The focus is, is helping folks right now. So... You know, that's that's a great thing about the American industrial complex right now. People are people are stepping up. Companies are stepping up. It's great to see. I couldn't agree more. Well, I appreciate all the time you spent with me, John. Again, this has been a great conversation. Good information that I think will help some folks. Hope we can do it again sometime. We think of you guys as a fantastic partner and we want to continue being that for you. But maybe we'll have this conversation again. I'd be more than happy to do it, Brian. Please keep in touch. Very nice to talk to you. Same here. You stay safe, John. Well, that's all for today's episode of On Air with Sick. Thanks for listening, and thank you to Brian Duncan for joining me today, along with John Hayes for providing his insight on AMRs in the retail market. Join us again next time with John Black from BrainCorp where we'll discuss how to retrofit existing equipment to make them autonomous. 
If you ever want more information on anything we talk about in this podcast, send us an email at info at sick.com. Until next time, I'm Rolf Agner, and this has been On Air with Sick.